All right, this morning we're going to be in our study of Gospel of Mark. Uh, we're in the 14th chapter. We're going to talk about denying Jesus. Now, I know if I say that, deny Jesus, many people say, deny Jesus? No, not me. I would never deny Jesus. I'm a believer, and I never would deny him. Well, sometimes what we say and what we actually do can be, end up being two different things. But it's a terrible thing to be denied, isn't it? I mean, some of you might think, well, maybe I've been denied on applying for a credit card, or I've been denied on some kind of an application that I've done for something else, and you don't like to see that red thing that says denied on that, do you? None of us do. We don't like it when people deny us, just act like we don't even exist. None of that is good. I remember a situation about 20 years ago. My brother was going to have his 50th birthday, and my sister-in-law, Trish, said, hey, why don't we surprise Steve? We'll go up to Chicago, where his, their son, Brian, lives with his family. We'll go up to Chicago, and the rest of the family can come on up. We'll go to the Renaissance Hotel up there, right there on Michigan and Wacker Streets, and we'll stay there. But what will happen is you guys get there ahead of time and get settled in and everything like that. And then I'll get there with Steve at a certain time, and when we're checking in, uh, why don't we just uh, have a, a special surprise? Like, why don't we do this? Why don't we have Luke, who was 13, 14 years of age at the time, why don't we have Luke just kind of walk through the lobby and do this a few times and see what happens with Steve? And you got to understand, we probably saw a family like that about once a year, and we didn't have all the phones that we were sending messages on and photos and everything. So things could change a little bit in the way that people look. So here comes Luke walking through the, the lobby, and Steve's standing there and Trish is doing all the signing in business. He's just kind of standing like he always does like this, and he looks and he sees Luke, and he goes. And you know what he's thinking is, that looks like my nephew, Luke, but what would he be doing in Chicago? I have no idea what he'd be up in Chicago for like that. So Luke just walks on through. So he turns around, and a little bit later, and he comes walking back through again, and Steve's standing there, and he sees him come through again. He's just going, No, can't be Luke, can't be Luke. And Luke's not saying anything. Luke's not even paying any attention to him. He's just walking right by him like he doesn't even exist like this, you know. We did this a few times, and then finally, all of us who were hiding behind whatever we could, little trees and things like that that were in the lobby, we all stepped out, and then he knew he'd been had. But I asked him later on, I said, how'd you feel? I mean, was that confusion? He says, I knew that had to be Luke. But why wasn't he speaking to me? <laughs> you know, what, what was going on? I don't understand why. But, you know, that's a form of denial. He just was acting like, I did not even know you, Uncle Steve. And Steve knew who it was. But he said, that didn't feel very good. It felt uncomfortable. You know, it does if you are on the receiving end of that, when somebody just denies that they even know you. I looked up the definition of denial in Webster's Dictionary, and it says it's a refusal to admit the truth or the reality of something. Refusal to admit the truth or reality. It doesn't change the fact that that's truth or that's reality. It's that you're having troubles accepting it, so you refuse it, and that's denial. We can all be in that situation where we are receiving denial from people. But what do you do when you, when I, deny Jesus? Oh, we never do that. I, I would never do that. I'm a believer. I love Jesus. And I, I love his church. I, I never do that. Well, let's take a look at, at Peter, who was supposed to be the rock, the one who Jesus could turn to and count on. Let's see what he did and make some comparisons about ourselves today. What do you do when you deny Jesus? When you don't admit the truth or reality of his presence, and authority in your life. Now, I want to just say this. It's a very personal thing. That's not something that we have to look at at a church level. That's an individual thing, your relationship with Christ and how you handle that relationship and what you allow to come into your life that maybe you're looking at uh, you'd rather do this over here rather than doing what Jesus wants you to do. That's a form of denial. What do you do when you do that kind of a thing and you realize I've done it? Well, let's examine the realities of what happens in this process by looking at Peter's life. First thing I'd tell you today is, before we get into our text, is Christ followers, that's what we've been calling all of us as we go through the study of Mark, because it's a study of discipleship, following Jesus. So the first thing I wanted to tell you is this, Christ followers will deny Jesus. That's an established fact. 
we do it in a variety of different ways. Peter's story is told by all four gospel writers. Now, why do I say that? Well, when all four gospel writers weigh in on something, you better pay attention. They all thought it was important enough to include in their gospel. So this story of Peter's denial is told in all four gospel uh, accounts. So when we go to Mark chapter 14, and you begin with verse number 27, just read a few verses of Scripture. Jesus looks at his disciples. They've just had the Last Supper. They've just gone out to the Mount of Olives. And as they're walking out there, Jesus is talking to them, and he says this to them. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. We know, as we've studied this before, Peter denies Jesus. The prediction that Jesus made does come true. We'll refer to that in just a moment in a little more detail. But I want to take a look at why this kind of thing can happen. And I just put this idea together. Denial and self-trust go hand in hand. Think through this with me a little bit as we look at Peter's life. Peter was a pretty confident individual. Peter was not the guy to sit back and just not do anything for the most part. He was always saying something. Now he might be on target and he might be putting his foot in his mouth. He was known for just being impetuous and just doing something or saying something. But one of the things that Peter was also guilty of, I would think, I use the word guilty, is self-trust. He had a lot of confidence in himself. What he thought, what he could do, and he set himself up because of his self-trust not to depend upon God enough. Do you remember when Jesus said to his disciples earlier on in the gospel, if you're going to follow after me, you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow after me. Denying self means that if you deny yourself and, 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 and just kind of resorting to yourself for everything, if you do that denial process, then you're going to lean into Christ. That's the idea that Jesus wanted you to do. He says, I want you to know you deny self and the things that would pull you away from me, deny those things, and then just lean into me, follow after me each and every day. And Peter didn't, and the Scripture says the rest of them agreed. Oh, I'll never leave you. Oh, and the rest of them, you can just hear them chiming in. Oh, I wouldn't either. I'd never do that, Jesus. Uh -huh. We'll see how the evening goes, is what Jesus is thinking. But they trusted that they would stand tough. They could take anything on. And no, anybody else will walk away from you. I won't do that. And every one of these disciples agreed with it all. But they failed to take into consideration human limitations rather than counting on God's power. They thought they were self-sufficient. I can do this thing because I believe in Jesus. And so that's all that matters, and I can do it on my own. And what you do when you, when you depend upon yourself too much like that and don't take into consideration that God can help you is you set yourself up to fail. Now, I want to look at having looked at self-trust, and it can lead you into a bad place where you end up denying Jesus. I want you to know how denial works, how it happens. And so you can go to the latter part of the chapter, chapter 14. I won't read all of this, but I'll just simply tell you what happens. They um, are up in the garden, and the rulers of the Jewish people were conspiring with the Romans to have Jesus arrested, and they were going to bring him up on Trump charges, and they were going to have him executed. That was the goal. So here they come, Jesus talking to his disciples, and the mob is coming to arrest him. And it says in Mark chapter 14, just one verse, just listen to these words. After they had arrested Jesus, Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. Now, don't just simply skirt over that as it's just a bit of a narrative, just a little bit of information for you. There are some significant things that are being said right there. That when they arrest Jesus and they're taking him off, 
they're pummeling him, pushing him, mocking him, shoving him, and they're going all the way down to the chief priest where he's going to stand trial before the chief priest. Peter is following along. Did you notice what it says there? This is not like a disciple. A disciple tries to get right almost into the tracks of his master, his rabbi. Peter is following at a distance. I'm going to watch what happens here. This isn't good what they're doing. They're taking Jesus off the trial, and I see how they're treating him. I don't know what this means for me, so I'm just going to hang back. He's already started the denial process. Then when he gets to the courtyard of the high priest, there's a fire that's going. It's nighttime, and people, the guards and all these guys are gathered around the fire. They're just kind of warming themselves. Peter not only follows at a distance into the courtyard and it takes Jesus into the presence of the high priest, he gets right in with the enemy and warms himself up by that fire like he's just one of the boys. Not saying anything, not doing anything. What it comes down to is there are denials of commission and denials of omission. The denials of commission are the actions that we do that speak louder than words. And the ones that are omission is we just don't say anything. There's just silence. And that's what we see Peter doing. And we say, shame on you, Peter. I mean, this is Jesus, and you followed him around for three and a half years. What is up with this? Why are you doing this to him? Well, I think Peter was fearful. That's the major mo motivation here. They're treating Jesus so bad, I don't want to be treated like that, so I'm just going to watch from a distance and see what happens. He's fearful that he might be brought into the same kind of treatment that Jesus is going through. He doesn't want anything to do with that. But I'm going to stay close. I'm going to watch a little bit and see what happens here. Fear of persecution. Fear of peer pressure. Who do I identify with here in this situation? Because you know what happens when you get to the courtyard, don't you? He's warming himself by the fire, and a servant girl, the high priest, comes out, and she stops, and she looks right at him, and she thinks, I think I know that guy. I think he hangs with the one they've got in there before the high priest. Don't I know you? Haven't you been with Jesus? No, I don't know the man. That's what Peter says. I don't know the man. Huh. And he kind of retreats away from the fire. He kind of goes to an outer part of the courtyard, and she kind of follows, looking at him, just looking and looking. She's, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I've seen you with him before, I don't know the man. I really don't know him. Hmm. You know, you even have an accent like his, a Galilean accent. I, I'm sure you've been with him. You're one of his followers. And Mark says that Peter denied it and called down curses on all these guys. Now, when I studied that out, call down curses, what does all that mean? It means he just started swearing. And they think probably that something like, Please don't take it wrong in the sermon here. This is what he said. He got so frustrated. Don't you know? You're one of them. You're like the Galilean. You're, you're, you're one of him. And he probably said, Damn it! I don't know him. Leave me alone. And called down other curses. He just started swearing. As he does so, Jesus has gone through round one with the high priest as far as being tried. And he starts to walk back through the courtyard. And as he does so, that's about the time that Peter's calling down curses. That's about the time that the rooster's crowing. That's about the time that Jesus pauses for just a moment and he looks right at Peter. He looks right at him. And Peter just kind of melts, ashamed, knowing he'd let Jesus down, and he runs away and he weeps bitterly, it says in the text. He fell away. Remember when I read the text? All of you are going to fall away. And it's going to happen before the night's over. I won't fall away. Yeah, you're all going to fall away. That word's used about three times in the text there. Fall away. It's not just fell away. They denied Jesus and fell away from him. Separated him, themselves from him. I looked the word up. I'm going to pronounce it in the Greek for you. You tell me what it sounds like, the word for fall away, what they did. Scandalizo, from which we get our word scandalous, a scandal. What it really means is there was a spiritual failure here. 
these guys spiritually failed Jesus Christ. And when you do that, that's scandalous. If you claim to be a follower of Christ, that's scandalous to do that kind of thing. And that's why Peter, knowing his failure, his spiritual failure, he went away and just cried. He had let Jesus down. And we say, well, boy, poor Peter, you know. And we even say, where are the rest of the guys? They're not even mentioned, are they? Where are they hiding out? They don't even want to be around. Well, what was wrong with those guys? Why did they do this? Don't be so quick to judge. We do it too. We do it at school. When our friends want to act a certain way, they want to use a certain language. We want to be accepted, so we want to talk like them. We start saying words we know we shouldn't say. We start considering habits that they, want, that they do that we think, if I want to be accepted, if I want to be cool, I'm going to do the habits that they do. You don't even look like a Christian at that point. Or in college, we cave to the pressure. A lot of the same things are going on there, too, that I just described. But then you've got professors to deal with who are not Christians, who are secularists. And they will mock you and make fun of you if they know you're a Christian. They'll do it right in class. I don't know if you've read the stories. I've read many of them. I don't know if you've seen the movies. There's been movies made about it. This is just what happens. And people cower back a little bit because they don't want to be rejected. We do it at work because we fear we might not get that promotion that we want. And we still just want to hang in with everybody else. That's who we work with all these hours during the week, so we just want to be accepted by them. So we start talking like them, acting like them. We pick up their habits. You know, folks, all that is is really just forms of denial that you're even a Christian because you're just walking away from the influence of Jesus. Shots get fired, sometimes literally, at Christians. Most of them, verbal barbs that are fired out. And what do we do? It's done in your presence. It's easier just, I better just keep my mouth shut because I don't want to invite any trouble for myself. And that's what we do. We fear taking a stand because of what others might think about us. We want to be accepted. We fear persecution and mockery or losing credibility. When somebody might say something like, oh, you're a Christian, how out of date. Today we live in a free and open society. There's no such things as absolutes. Do your own thing. The Bible says otherwise. Oh, that's just an old archaic book. Come on, man, get into 21st century. That's what people are really saying. And so through our actions or through our silence, we fail. We deny Jesus. But there's good stuff coming. We're all in the same boat, but there's good stuff coming. Christ followers remember Jesus will always be faithful. Even when we've been faithless, even when we've denied him, and through our actions, through our speech, we just haven't stood up for him, he will still be faithful. Now, I want you to see in the midst of what I read just a little while ago from the text, when Jesus says, you're all going to fail me, fail me," because uh, as Zechariah said in his prophecy that the the chief shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. You're going to fall away just like that. Now notice before any conversation takes place between Peter and Jesus, notice what Jesus says, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. What's significant about that statement? It's really simple. He knows that they're all going to turn on him. They're all going to be failures. They're going to deny him with their actions or just through their silence, they're going to deny him. But he knows they'll come back to him because I'm going to rise from the dead. That's all part of the plan. And when I rise from the dead, I'll be ahead of you, waiting on you guys, waiting on you to restore you for what you are really supposed to do. He knows what's going to happen, though they don't understand it. All they can say for the time being is, I won't do this, I'm not going to deny you. Yeah, it's going to happen, but I will restore you. Now, verse 28 then tells us why this can happen, because the resurrection is a guarantee. It's a guarantee. If he's going to rise from the dead, then whatever's wrong is going to be put right. It's coming. Guarantees that things can be right. We won't live by just our own power, our own self-sufficiency, our self-trust. We won't live by that. You know what we'll live by? We're going to start living by the power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that's available for all of us to live the life he, he has designed for us. 
And we remember there's a faithful promise, always a faithful promise. Jesus was making a promise there. I'll go ahead of you after my resurrection. After all that's taken place, I'm going to go ahead, be ahead of you, waiting on you. And then there's some passages of Scripture that, that help to nail this down a little bit, too. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. If we are faithless, if we deny Jesus because of pressure, whatever it is, he won't give up on us because he's faithful. That's just who he is. And when we do blow it, there's always a way back. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9. John writes, If we confess our sins, including when we have denied Jesus, when we've been faithless, if we can confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, meaning He will restore us. Purification means we've been restored in His presence. That's what happens. Christ's followers will always remember that Jesus can't be anything but faithful to us, even if we've been faithless. So when Peter failed and Jesus looked at him, what kind of look was it that he got? Was it the look, way to go, Peter, you messed up? Was it condemnation that, it, that, he, that he gave to him? Was it that kind of a look? Now, when I think of the look, think of that show Home Improvement. Remember that? They had one episode on there where all the guys were all doing the macho thing, all standing around, with, oh, 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 like Tim Allen and all those guys used to do. Remember that? And they were talking about how bold and how brave they were, and, man, they had their act all together. Nobody tells me what to do until one of the guy's wives walks into the hardware store where they were all talking. Remember that? She heard them. The one guy just talking. He was blowing it all around how big and bad he was and everything like that, and she was standing right behind him, and all the guys were going, you know, because getting ready for the look, because when he turned around, it was, there's the look. Ugh. You know, he about unglued at, the, at that moment. Was it that kind of look that just condemns and wilts you? I don't think it was. Not that kind of look. Not one of condemnation that broke Peter's heart. I think it was something different. Beth Moore describes it quite well in her book, Jesus, the One and Only, when she's talking about this account. She says these words, I wonder if Christ fixed gaze might have said something like this. Remember, Peter, I am the Christ. You know that, and I know that. I called you. I gave you a new name. I invited you to follow me. Don't forget who I am. Don't forget what you are capable of doing. And whatever you do, don't let this destroy you. When you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. That's the kind of look he probably got. One that says there's forgiveness and there's restoration. And when you get strong enough, help your brothers out. That's the look that Jesus would give to each one of us if and when we deny him. It's always one that builds up. It just dawned on me. I was watching a game yesterday. Uh, Missouri had no problem scoring on Missouri State University yesterday. There was one kid that was playing on defense, trying to guard one of the wide receivers from Missouri, and he got burned twice. I mean, burned badly twice. And if you're watching, you understand he just didn't do what he was supposed to do the way he's been coached up. So as the defensive unit's coming off the field after both of those scores, the second time they're coming off the field, they, one of the defensive coordinators was calling everybody over here to all the defensive players like that. But Coach Les Steckel, who used to be the defensive coordinator at Missouri, a great defensive coordinator, he was stepping out. He's the head coach, and he was going like this. Now, I didn't have binoculars. I could really see the look on his face, but I think it was something that was not one of anger and condemnation. You've seen some of those coaches railing and screaming and yelling and everything. Like, that was not it. He just simply went like this, and the kid came over, and the coach walked over and put his arm around the boy and began to talk to him a little bit. And then it was like, you got it? He nodded his head like that, and the kid went like that. Hit him on the back, said, okay, and he walked on. That kid played a better game from that point forward. I watched to see if he was going to get burned anymore. I think the coach just said, you messed up. You didn't do what we talked about, but you're going to be back in that game, and everything's going to be all right. That's what Jesus does. He says, I'm, I'm getting you back in the game. I can forgive. 
and I can help you get right back to where you need to be. So Christ followers always have to remember that. He's always about forgiveness. He's always about restoration. Now here's the thing that I want to really drive home as, as we get to the close of this message today. Christ followers can still be used by God after denial. We might be able to say, oh, I accept the fact that he can forgive. I accept the fact that he restores me. That means I'm still going to get into heaven, doesn't it? But I don't know what else I can do for him because I blew it. We just beat up on ourselves too much. I want you to see what he did with Peter. Because it tells us that we can get back in the game. We can still be used by God in a powerful way. So when I go to the Gospel of John, the 21st chapter, this is after Jesus' resurrection. The disciples are out fishing, doing their morning thing. Life is going on. And Jesus comes along the shoreline, and he fixes breakfast, gets a fire going and fixes breakfast, and calls them out. Man, they see him. They want to get into him. You know, this is Jesus. It's, he's alive. We know he's alive, but he's on the shoreline. We've got to go meet with him. And they start rowing like crazy to get in there. Peter can't wait. Man, he strips down, and he jumps into the water, and he swims to the shore ahead of the rest of them. They had breakfast together. I bet it was a nice breakfast, too. But after breakfast was over, when they'd finished eating, John chapter 21, verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, come here, I want to talk to you. And he says to him, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than fishing and all the things that you do in life? Do you love me more than these things? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, well, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now notice what's happening here in this story. I think there really are three times that Jesus asked him, do you love me, corresponding to each one of those three denials. I really think that's what's going on here. But he's not just saying, tell me that you love me, because all sins are forgiven. If you love me, tell me that. But he's also saying, I want you to get on with the business I have for you now, and that is you're going to have to feed my sheep. There's a church that's getting ready to be born, and you're going to be a leader in it. Get ready to do your job. So a couple of things. One word is restoration. He restores Peter in that moment. And the second thing that happens is focus. Peter was focused. Peter would be the guy who stands. Now, the guy who denied Jesus was, a, was, was scared to death. But Peter would be now the guy, once he gets his focus straightened out, once he knows he's been restored in the good graces of Christ, he'll be the guy who stands up before the other disciples in front of thousands of people in Jerusalem, and he will preach the first great sermon, and the church would be born that day, and he would be a leader all the way to Rome, where he ended up as a prisoner of the Roman government where he would be crucified and ask them, please do not crucify me like you did my Savior. I don't deserve that. Crucify me upside down. And the historians say it's exactly the way he met his death. Peter didn't have a problem with denying Jesus again after that. Paul's encouragement to a young preacher named Timothy is instructful for us as well. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Timothy's under a lot of pressure. Cultural issues were affecting him. If you read the book of Ephesus as well, or the book of Ephesians as well as First and Second Timothy, it would be you know, easy for a young guy just to get discouraged. And he says to him, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Fan into flame how God has prepared you uniquely with your gifts to do the work that God has called you to do. Then he looks at Timothy and he says, in verse 14, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Now catch this next phrase. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Don't try to do what Peter did. Don't try to say, I've got a lot of power in myself. I've got a lot of confidence in myself. I can stand against anything. No, you guard what God has given to you. And don't let anybody take it away from you. Don't let anybody put pressure on you to pull you away. You guard that thing and, and do it this way with the help of the Holy Spirit. Don't try to do it on your own. That's what happens. 
We can be restored when we deny Christ. We can be told, you have a place of service. You're still useful. So remember this in the conclusion. Remember that Jesus is all about restoration. That's what it is. What he's all about is restoration. We mess up. We ask for forgiveness. He forgives and he restores. We become better than we were before. So, don't be one who is willing to compromise with the world. Just simply say, I know what's right, I know what's wrong, and I'm going to do what God wants me to do. We haven't had the pressure that Peter had. We haven't had the pressure that a lot of Christians around this world have had to deal with. Easy for them to maybe deny just to save their lives. But I want to tell you, just as, as I close today, about a 32-year-old pastor in 2013 named Saeed Abedini. Saeed was sentenced to eight years in prison in Iran for planting church houses. Now, what he was doing was he was going into people's homes, and they were getting neighbors together, and they were starting these home churches, if you will. And in five years' time, they were up and running about 2,000 members. This is in Iran, which they will kill you for being a Christian. He was convinced that he needed to leave and go to the United States, he and his wife, Negma, and they went to the United States for some safety. But at the same time, he said, I, I, I just can't leave my country behind. And so he started going back, making trips back into Iran, and he began to build an orphanage. Figured he can do some good with kids and everything and, and plant Christ in their lives. So he was building this orphanage, and he was arrested in 2012, and he was sent to the notorious Evan Prison. He was tortured, he was mocked, he was threatened. But back home, his wife was pleading with the government here, the United States Senate was working in this thing, Amnesty International was working in it. But the power of prayer, she kept calling everyone to prayer. And everybody was basically saying, I don't think he's going to come out. Not in Iran, you don't do that kind of a thing. But he was released last January. And here's what he said. Everything I went through was designed for one thing. They wanted me to deny Jesus. He wouldn't do it. He'll go back again, I think. Because you see, for us, to do what he wants us to do has no limitations. With God, all things are possible if we trust him, if we don't deny him, but we lean into him. So remember that Jesus is all about restoration and helping us stay focused on the mission until someday when he calls us all home. Stay faithful. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the story of Peter. He's so much like us and so many things that he says and does. And in this story today, with all the bravado beating his chest and saying, I will never deny you, I won't fall away. But that's how we are when the pressure's on. And we desire more acceptance and we want an easier path. And we will, through our actions of commission and omission, through the things that we do as well as the silence that we have, those are all steps to denying you. Forgive us, Father, when we do that. Help us to have courage and insight to know how to speak up for you, to know how to serve you consistently. What matters here on this earth is just going to last a short time, but it lasts into eternity if we're serving you the way we're supposed to. So help us not to trade it all in for just acceptance, to trade it all in for an easier path, but to know that there's blessing, there's joy for the journey, but we're going to have some tests before us as well, and we don't want to fail those tests. So I pray your blessing upon each person in this room today. Speak to their hearts. I can only say so much. Your word says a lot. But as you speak into their hearts, then we get clearly a vision of what you want from us. And we'll know the right words to say when the time comes. We'll know how to take a stand the right way when the time comes. So I pray that all of us will lean into you and never through our actions and through our words will we ever deny you. 
Thank you, Father, for loving us, for always being interested in restoring us when we fail you, because we will at times. But I pray, Father, that we will always know the joy of restoration and a focus of service for you until that day when we come home, really come home. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.